Hello and welcome to the WI Just Journal Public Affairs Program. I'm Jerry Williams. Well, recently, the Family Institute of Connecticut had their annual gala at the beautiful AquaTurf. Author Eric Metaxas was this year's keynote speaker. And today you're going to hear clips from what he had to say. Happening now on the WHS Journal, it's news and public affairs. It's a huge blessing to be here tonight and to hear the work uh, that the Family Institute of Connecticut is doing. You guys understand, Peter is a hero. You understand that? Yeah. And, uh, and let me just cut to the chase. At the end of tonight, you should write him a big check. Did you know that? Yeah, I hope that makes you uncomfortable. You should write him a big check, because if you're not helping him, you're not helping him. You understand that? This is amazing to me that in Connecticut, just this video, to hear the battles that you're going through. And it's a funny thing. These battles don't fight themselves. Someone has to fight the battles. And Peter and the family, they're fighting this battle. You know this for you, right? Everything goes to hell in a handbasket if Peter does not do what he does and if he's not funded to do what he does. And imagine if they had the money to do way more of what they're doing. I want to be real clear that um, we all need to do more, right? Because we kind of leave it to some people to to do it. We let people be, oh, he's outspoken, he's in that battle. We We all have to pitch in. If we all pitch in, it changes everything. This is the close of my speech, uh, but I just started, so let me, uh, let me go back. Let me go back. Um, some of you know uh, that I'm a, a Connecticut native. I grew up in Danbury, Connecticut. Yeah, and we crushed all you guys in, uh, in sports. That's not true. Uh, I grew up in Danbury, Connecticut. I'm thrilled to say that uh, my brother, my nephew, and my 90-year-old mother are here at Table 17. Yeah. If you meet my mother, tell her she looks 84, because she'd, she'd really appreciate that. But it's just so great to have my family here with me. It thrills me to see this kind of turnout in Connecticut. And one of the reasons that I decided to speak tonight at a fraction of my normal fee uh, is because I love Connecticut, and I care about what God is doing in Connecticut. And I mean... And I really, I really do mean that. When I'm invited to speak in a blue state or in a place like this, it means everything to me. I'm going to be there if I can be there because I know how tough it is. I, I can imagine what you all are going through here. I get invited all the time to speak in like Dallas and Florida and Phoenix and all these places. But I know that you guys are, you're, you're really on fire. I mean, to be a conservative Christian and to believe what you believe in a place like this, it's just much harder. And so I want to say God bless you for being faithful. Uh, it, it, it really is uh, vital that you do what you do. Now, uh, some of you know, um, I wrote a book called Letter to the American Church. I know that uh, they had copies here. I guess they ran out of my, the, the sequel to that is called Religionless Christianity, which is just more of the same but it all comes from my Bonhoeffer book. Now, this is true, right? I, I never thought I would write a biography in my life. People think, oh, Eric, you write biographies. I never planned to write biographies. Uh, I thought I'd be a fiction writer. Some of you know I went to Yale University, which is a Marxist training ground down the street. It's, it's so funny because people think like I'm proud of going to Yale. It is such a despicable place. Do you understand how spiritually dark Yale University is? It's unbelievable only outdone perhaps by Wesleyan. But it's like a miracle to go to a place like that and then to emerge and then somehow we know by the grace of God alone to come to see things as they are and not as they would like us to see it. And that's kind of a, a, a microcosm of the battle we all face, right? We live in a world where the media would have you believe that Half the people, or more than half the people, believe all the loony stuff that you know is not true. And you get, you'd get that impression because the cultural elites who have a lot of power, right, they, they give you the impression that what no one really believes, lots of people believe. I mean, is there anybody who really believes that a rooster might be able to lay an egg? Does anybody believe that? We're being gaslit, obviously, in this world. And I, so I'm here to encourage you to say that Most people know what's right and what's wrong. Most people in America know what's right and what's wrong, but we're often fooled into thinking that 
you're in the minority. You're, you're not in the minority. That's why it's very, very, very important for us to speak the truth. When you speak the truth, you encourage people around you to speak the truth. By the way, the Bonhoeffer book uh, came out in 2010. And why did I write that book? I wrote that book effectively because my mom, who is here, grew up in Nazi Germany. And when I heard from my friend Ed Tuttle about this guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's, who stood against the Nazis, who spoke up because of his faith in Jesus, spoke up for the Jews, I said, you got to be kidding me. I could be interested in that kind of Christianity, okay? Because that's real. That, that's, that's somebody who's willing to live out his faith. Because if you're not willing to live out your faith, I don't think you really have faith. I think that the scripture is real clear. Faith without works is dead. And the American church has drifted to a place, the German church was in the same place in the early 30s, where they kind of act like, oh, it's all about faith. Uh, it's all about what I believe. And you know what? If it's real faith, yes. But God says if you have real faith, it will be manifested in how you live. And if you're not living self-sacrificially, if you're not living uh, as though you believe Jesus defeated death on the cross, then you don't really believe it. And that should scare us, right? Because it's important that we believe those things. And so the Bonhoeffer story really amazed me when I first heard about it, because I'd always asked, my mother grew up in Nazi Germany. My people were, were in this mess. And I know that just as there are many Americans today who aren't on board with whatever lunacy our administration is pushing, there were many Germans, many people in my family, they were not on board with what was being done in their name. And I wondered, how did it happen that a nation that was extraordinarily Christian, culturally Christian, um, that was extraordinarily sophisticated, uh, that in many ways is dramatically similar to where we are today, how did a nation like that slide down into the nightmare abyss that we all know about? We all know about it now, what happened? How did that happen? Uh, and so when I wrote the Bonhoeffer book, it was very personal to me because my mother and my family literally lived there when it happened. So anybody who's uh, tempted to think that it happened, you know, a million years ago, you can talk to my mother. She's right there. She lived through it. She lost her father in the war. This is real. And I realize that we've somehow gotten this idea that it's, we, it's an outlier. We put it in a box someplace over there. We don't really take it seriously that it could happen here. And so when I wrote the Bonhoeffer book, I honestly had no idea that it would be received the way it was. Of all my books, it was a, a genuine bestseller. It sold over a million copies. Uh, it was translated into 20 languages, and it will soon be translated back into English so that we can read it again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I had no idea that that would happen. And I realized the reason that it was so compelling to so many people is because the story of Bonhoeffer is a compelling story. It's undeniable. It's not, it's not fiction. I didn't make it up. It's a real story. It's a true story. And I recommend it to you, not because I wrote it, but because he lived it. And when you read about the life of a real hero, it cannot help but inspire you to want to live like that. It cannot help but do that. And, and so I've written a number of biographies, but that one is the, is the signal one that, in a sense, people have come up to me for all these years. It came out in 2010, and so many people have said, the book changed my life. Now, I know it's not the book that changed their life. It's his life changed their lives. Because when you read about someone who lives what you know to be right and true, and you see it, you want to be like that. You can't help it. You're, you're made in the image of God. And you respond to that. Similarly, when you're surrounded by people who aren't living right, it really lures you uh, into not caring. And so the point is, how you live affects other people. People are watching each of us. And so the Bonhoeffer story is the most dramatic example, in a sense, because he lived out his faith so remarkably, so beautifully, that it, it can't help touch people. And so I really believe God called me to write that book prophetically, because I could tell when I was writing it, and I'm not making this up, I knew that this was coming to us. Now, that's an amazing thing to say, because I wrote the book in 2008, but I could sort of sense by the Spirit of God, and I don't say that kind of stuff lightly, that this is on our horizon. Well, here we are. There is no doubt that none of us dreamt five years ago that we could be here. 
in a genuine existential crisis for the soul of America in a way that is palpable. There's no exaggeration because you could have said this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but it would not have been what it is now. And that was the voice of author Eric Metaxas as he spoke at the Family Institute of Connecticut's annual gala. Join me tomorrow at the same time for part two. If you would like more information about what you heard today, call WHS 860-346-1049, 860-346-1049. The opinions expressed are those of the participants, not necessarily of those of the staff or management of the station. I'm Jerry Williams for the WHS Journal. It's news and public affairs.